Hello, beloved people of God. House filled with beautiful, talented, and spirit-filled women. I had the invitation for this women's conference in the year 2020. Due to pandemic, we could not join, we could not meet. It got postponed to 2022. I believe this is an appointment time of God with you. Amen. I was honored to receive this invitation from Pastor Ashish Raichu. I admire his leadership, his humility, and his simplicity. How many of you agree with me? <laughs> Shall we express a gratitude for him and his team for putting up this amazing conference? <laughs> when I saw the theme, glow, I was very excited because we all women like the glow. <laughs> we do silver facial, gold facial, oxy facial, diamond facial for the wedding, for the party, for the functions, right? So I also found another secret of glow on your face, how you can maintain the glow all the time and maintain the smile. I found a scripture for that. Psalm 34, verse number 5. It says, they that look to the Lord will shine like radiance. Their faces are never covered in shame. Amen? Jesus, the Son of God, he shines with all brilliance. 10,000 suns are not equivalent to him. And when you look at him, when you look at his glory day after day, like the moon looks at the sun and reflects the beauty of the sun, you will reflect the beauty of the Son of living God. Amen. God has called you to be sons of God. Do you know that? In the kingdom of God, in the New Testament, they do not call you daughters. You can go and refer Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 as homework. When you see Apostle Paul's writings, he does not address women as daughters. He calls them as sons. You know why? Because the spirit of the Son of God has come to live in us. Romans chapter 8 says we have the sonship. That is, son is nothing to do with male or female. Son is the one who has the nature of the Father. Amen. You have the nature of God. You are God kind. Amen. Patient, humble, righteous, holy, accepted, blameless. Just like Jesus, so are you in the world, it says, right? First John chapter 4, verse 17, I'm justifying with the scripture. So it says you are like Jesus. If you are like Jesus, that means what is it? Son or daughter? You have sonship. You are a spirit because you are not your body. You are a spirit, amen? So God sees you as spirit. God sees you as twin of Jesus, Amen? You have an identical twin in heaven. As Jesus is, so are you. What a profound truth. When you know this, you will embrace your calling. You will embrace your purpose. Amen? As David said, he fulfilled. It says in the book of Acts chapter 13, verse number 32. You can show them the first scripture in my PPT. It says, David, after he fulfilled his purpose, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers. What I like about the scripture is he fulfilled, he served the purpose of God in his own generation. Amen. So David served the purpose of God. That is exactly what Jesus did. John chapter 17 verse number 4. It says, these are the words of Jesus, last words of Jesus to his disciples. He said, I have glorified you here on earth. I have finished my work. I'm quoting from NKGV version. This is ESV version. I have accomplished the work that you have given me. Who gave the work? Father God gave the work, assigned the work to Jesus. And Jesus finished that work. No wonder at the cross of Calvary, he said, 
it is finished. Tetelestai. It's over. Completely complete. Nothing is incomplete. All the work is done. So what am I trying to relate to you? I told you are a son. I told the spirit of the son is in you. I told that God has adopted you as sonship. That is Romans chapter 8. That means every one of you in this room has the potential to do the works more than what Jesus did. That's what he said as the son of God. And it says that you have a purpose in your life. You're married, unmarried, your mother, your single, whatever is the state of your life. You're working, you're homemaker. You are old, you're young, you're thin, you're fat, you're short, you're tall, whatever. We come in all sizes, right? And we are beautiful women. So all these people, all, every one of you, all of you, God has created for a purpose. And the purpose that God has for you, nobody can do that. Your fingerprint is unique. It's not even identical to the twin. Your fingerprint is very different from your siblings, from your parents, from any of your family member. What does that mean? It means you're fearfully, wonderfully created for his purpose. He has a purpose. You are very special and what you can do, nobody can do. Amen? Did you hear me? What you can do, nobody can do. Nobody sitting around you, no one you see here on the pulpit, no one, the icons that you see on TV, nobody can do what you can do. Amen? God has made you unique. God has made you special. May you know that, believe that, embrace that, and rise up as a son of God. Amen? So when you embrace your purpose, when you know what God has deposited in you, what God has given, God sent his son, God gave his blood, God gave his name, God gave his spirit. He has invested too much on us, isn't it? Too much he has invested. His investment should be worth investing, right? We should fulfill the call that God has upon our lives. We live in a broken world. There are a lot of brokenness that is around. I understand people going through difficulties. People might have had uh, abusive childhood, uh, single parents, sickness in the body, poverty, there are a lot of things that can go wrong in an individual, but that should not stop us from fulfilling the purpose that God has for us. If we are whining and we are sad about things that has gone wrong and looking at the past, looking behind, if we are constantly driving, looking at the rear view mirror, we cannot go further. So let's look forward, amen? Let's look forward and see the big prize, the big goal, the big purpose that God has for every one of us in this room, amen? So the title for my message that Pastor Nancy gave from the church was called to pastor. So how I started pastoring, just a little bit, very quick uh, testimony, and then we'll get into some scriptures. Uh, I didn't start off directly pastoring, as you heard my introduction. I'm from Hindu background, Rajput background. My maiden name is Priya Singh. So I was going to church, and I started off involving in every activity to be available. God does not use talented people. He uses available people. Amen. So you, you, you should be available. I was available in the choir, there for serving, Holy Communion, offering team, every team. Name the team, every team. Just be available because I knew only that at that time because I didn't want to go back home because I had a lot of issues at home as a teenager. My parents were going through a lot of rift and they were about to be separated and things were going bad in the family and I was looking for love. Uh, my father had uh, abandoned us at that time and uh, I was wanting to receive that fatherly love. And during that uh, situation, when I was hungry for love, 
I met Jesus. He lavished his love. Initially, it was very hard for me to call God as father because I have experience of my father who remarried and abandoned. So I could not accept the title Daddy God, Father God. I would always call him El Shaddai, Elohim. I like to call him Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. All the names of God except Abba Father. I said, God, Father is a bad title for you. <laughs> I don't want to call you that way and it hurts me and I feel I'm degrading you by calling you Abba because I didn't understand. It was, it was hurting. I was hurting inside. It took me years to understand God as a father, to understand father is someone who is not the one who has given you birth alone. He has not just given you his gene. He is the one who takes responsibility. He is your source. He's there for you. He's your strength. He's your defender. He's your provider. He's your protector. He is all in all. And I found that in Jesus. Amen. Then years, lo and behold, I learned and I humbled myself to call God Abba, Daddy God, because my heart was healed. Now I call him always Daddy God. Daddy is such a personal relationship. Why you call him Daddy? Because I told you, you are his son. You have the nature of your father. Amen? You are just like your father. You, you are created in his image. And when you understand this, when you see God as your daddy, irrespective of your age, maybe you had good dad or bad dad or uh, whatever, whatever past you had. But let me tell you, Father God, no match to anybody's love, unconditional love that he has lavished. Words cannot explain the love that he has poured on every one of us. And he demonstrated this love while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8. How he demonstrated? He sent his son and made him to die on the cross of the Calvary. On the Calvary, even before I ask, even before I fast, even before I pray, he has healed us, he has blessed us, he has prospered us, he has restored us. Amen? I didn't have to do 40 days fasting prayer to receive my healing. Right? He, has, he had already healed 2,000 years ago. It is finished work of the cross. So when you understand the work is finished, when you understand the restoration is finished, when you understand the prosperity is given, when you understand the work the, before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain for you, when you understand this, you understand how much God loves you. Your prayers change your way of life change, then now you are not going to God to receive something. You're going to God because you've already received. Amen? Now you give not to get something. You give because you've already got it. Amen? Now you go to pray not because you want to finish that one hour of clock. <laughs> one hour. Can't you watch for one hour, Peter? One hour can I watch? You don't watch the clock. You are lost in the love of the Father. Amen. So I started into all uh, activities and uh, church ministry. And then uh, people around me, my pastors, my husband, my leaders, they saw that I, I was passionate about my teaching, passionate about people. If you are a pastor, two things are must. You should love to teach and you should love your people, amen. You should have the shepherd's heart. All kinds of people get along with people. You, 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 you should be happy to be with people. So that is one of the way to know that you are people's person and probably you are into pastoring. I'm not saying, I'm not telling everyone is called here to pastoring. I'm just giving some tips if you are planning, if, if God is impressing that on your heart. Highly committed role, need to be there at the good times of people. And the toughest thing is at the bad times of people. The, the most bad thing for pastors to do is funerals. That's, that, that is one thing about my job that I don't like. Apart from doing funerals, I love 
everything else. I love preaching God's word, teaching God's word, and hanging around with people. So how I started, uh, as I was teaching at the age of 17, uh, I started my ministry. Uh, I was uh, teaching, doing crusades, evangelism, conducting programs in and around Bangalore city. And then years passed by and people got to see that. Uh, and I personally experienced the call that God had on my life to teach and to share the unadulterated word of God. And I must say, my husband is the best thing that happened to me. <laughs> Whatever I lost uh, in my childhood or the love that I wanted to receive from my parents, from my dad, God restored in my husband. Amen. He's a God of restoration. So all the young people, unmarried people, first let me talk to them, and then I come to all the married people. <laughs> so all the young people, unmarried people, when I talk about uh, my husband, you must be wondering and asking this to yourself, how do I get a husband like that? <laughs> so very simple thing. See, uh, when I, I was reading the book of Hosea when I was 18, 19, and when I read the book of Hosea, I saw the Lord told Hosea to marry a prostitute. Okay, then uh, I was like, God, this is very hard thing that you have done. And then as I was praying, it impressed on my heart, and I learned eventually that uh, the greatest gift that is Jesus, himself, God has given a choice. It's a choice for you. You choose Jesus, right? God has given this choice, free will to you, that you choose Jesus. That means your spouse, you choose it's not that God comes down and chooses for you. So you choose. Now, coming to the other side of the coin, other side of the story, that is, when I say you choose, that does not mean you abandon the work of the Holy Spirit or reject the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You involve the Holy Spirit. When you invite and involve the Holy Spirit, you give your authority, you submit to his leadership and say, God, I want, I want your will to be done in my life, not my will. So when I read the book of Hosea, I saw that he, was, he submitted to the will of God and I just knelt down at the bedside and said, God, I don't mind whatever person you bring, but let it be your will. Let it be your choice. May you guide me. I surrender. If, if whoever I am going to choose, whoever I am going to fall in love with, let it be God direction to me. Let the Holy Spirit guide me. Let Holy Spirit speak to me. Now, second question. You'll ask me, how do I know Holy Spirit speaks? Will Holy Spirit show the scripture? Anand Abraham. That scripture is not there. <laughs> Now, how do I find that? See, you can, uh, you can cross-check whether it is your flesh or devil or Holy Spirit by two things. Number one, Holy Spirit never contradicts the word of God. Amen? The word of God is the will of God. What is written is the will of God for your life. In the word of God, when you read the word, when you meditate on the word, it's not like we open the word. Holy Spirit, speak to me. I have done that. Don't feel guilty. I have done that. I used to do that a lot as a teenager. I say, then I read something. I said, no, 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 this is not from the Holy Spirit. I close it. I can say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Then I guess, no, this is not. I do until I find a verse. Okay, this is what the Holy Spirit has done. <laughs> now I've grown from there. Now I don't do that anymore. So as you keep reading chapter after chapter, word, uh, scriptures, as you continue to read, there'll be one scripture that will pop out. It will touch you. You will feel that this is for you. It is the word at the season. Amen. That is number one way Holy Spirit always speaks. And the second way, easiest way that Holy Spirit speaks is you will have peace in your heart. When you're making any decision, you're planning to get married, you, you, you are uh, uh, finalizing something in your life. So it will, uh, there will be peace in your heart. When there is 
peace, when you're led by peace, because the Prince of Peace is there within. When the Prince of Peace wants you to go ahead, because it says in the book of Philippines, it is he who wills and does according to the good pleasure of the Father. It is he who wills in you and he will make you to do. So when you have peace in your heart, if there is peacelessness, restlessness, there is confusion, put a break. Hold on with that person. Don't rush. Say, I need time. I need to wait. I need to think it over. I need to meditate. And take the counsel of godly people. Counsel of the people in the word. Your leaders, your pastors. Because they know more word than you. So they'll be able to see things through the word. So they'll be able to guide you. So when you do these things, when you're led in the spirit, when you have peace in your heart for whatever decision, not only for marriage, you're doing a joint venture, you're starting a business, you're planning to go somewhere, whatever it is, whatever decision you want to take, when you are led in the spirit, that is uh, when you're having peace, you know for sure that you are led in the spirit. That is one of the best way to know that God is guiding you. And then as you continue to do this, eventually you train your ear. You know, someone, whoever has learned music, you can relate to me. So a musician, when he is learning his scales or keyboard or uh, guitar, they say ear training. Why ear training? <laughs> they have to train their ear to see scale, E sharp. They have to train the ear. Starting, we don't get to know. Eventually, we know exactly what it is. Similarly, when the father speaks, when daddy God speaks, he is your shepherd, you are his sheep. As you train continuously, you will be able to know immediately, this is not my voice. It's not the voice of flesh. It is not the voice of devil. It is the voice of the father. Amen. That's what Jesus did, right? Jesus said, I do only what I hear from you. I say only what you want me to say. That becomes a routine. So that's for young people, some uh, advice. That's one of the way that I found a wonderful uh, person in my life who encouraged me, who pushed me to start this ministry. He told me that God has called on your life not just to do anything and everything. God has called you specifically to be a pastor. And then I took my ordination and started pastoring. When I started pastoring, it was a home church in my living room. Uh, maybe we started with two, that is myself and my husband. <laughs> he would always sit in the front and listen to me. Sunday after Sunday, he'll come and say, amazing sermon, amazing sermon. <laughs> Every time I look back, I wonder like how on earth he liked my sermon. Because people would criticize me. Uh, uh, like two, three years back, they would say, you're, you're, you're talking too fast. Or they say, you talk too slow. Or they say, your grammar is not correct. So many corrections I get from people. And then he's always, no, they all are lying. I am telling you the truth. <laughs> that kept me going. You know, that was so encouraging. You know, someone who's close to you uh, and who is always admiring, appreciating. And I stand up here. I look at him from the stage always, front row. He's sitting and he's always clapping. And then he comes back home and he says, it was amazing. It was awesome. Some of my church members are there. They all agree, right? <laughs> so that was uh, beautiful. And after two, we became 10. We were in the living room. And then I knew very little about God's word. I had passion, but I had no knowledge of God's word. Here's where I come to. Knowledge of God's word. In all you're getting, get understanding. I had no understanding. I knew here and there some scriptures, but no understanding, no revelation, no right knowledge of God, rightly dividing. It says, right, right believing leads to right living. So you need to have right believing. How do I right believe? How do I have rightly believing when I am not rightly understanding? I misunderstand. I understand the Job who says God gave and God take, took away, right? That's not right. That's not right. Okay, those of you who, who do not know, it's not God who gives and it's not God who takes away. That is the perspective of Job that is written. So that's all I knew at that time. So I started the church. I knew very little, as I said. And uh, at that time, I had got uh, a faith book in my hand. And I preached in my home church for nine Sundays, back to back, 
on faith. Series of faith. Do not doubt, confess, believe and receive. Amazing, amazing, profound truths. I was preaching back to back. That it had just come into me. The word, the sower sowed the word. The word of God had just come into me and I started preaching. As I was preaching, I was carrying our second baby at that time. And it was nine months and I'm preaching back to back nine Sundays. And next day, that's Monday, I get a vision that baby is no more in the womb. There were only two weeks left for the delivery. Every scan was normal, every report was uh, fine, BP, sugar, everything was fine. There was no hint in the scan, every time everything was fine. So I'm just due for I think hardly 14 days, just two weeks. So up around uh, say 36, 37 weeks. And then I get this uh, kind of vision and I was disturbed. So, and I could feel there were no movements for past um, two days. So, I call my brother because my husband was working. So, I call, so let's go to the hospital. I just want to check it. I don't, I didn't tell him anything. I said, we'll just check it. So, he rushed me to the hospital. So, we went and then they checked the scan. They did, uh, what is that, Doppler test. And then they said, we are very sorry to say there is no heartbeat. Baby is dead and so many nurses came one after the other so many doctors you know the situation was very panicky right all the senior gynecologists came it was like almost uh, uh, past 10 they were coming from eight o'clock one by one everybody was checking they were seeing the scan two three doctors came together they saw the scan they said i'm very sorry very sorry to say very sorry to say, how did this happen? Why it happened? Where are the reports? Everything is fine. They had no answer. And I am weeping, crying. I don't know which scripture to stand on. I only know something vaguely. Jesus rises people from dead. I am telling everybody, come, please pray. Let us pray for resurrection. But I don't have that conviction because I'm emotionally down, completely broken. You know, they say, right? For children to bury their parents, somehow they are prepared. They know that parents get old and we are prepared. But for parents to bury their children, it's the hardest thing to do. And at that time, they told you have to immediately take uh, to cesarean because normal cannot happen. So in the cesarean room, there were many doctors around me and the senior gynecologist, uh, he was my friend and they were all uh, encouraging me, but no words of counsel could comfort me at that time. I am weeping profusely, and my heartbeat, I could hear my heartbeat is going low. Something is happening. He's saying, the doctor is saying, Priya, wake up, wake up, wake up, don't sleep, don't sleep, don't cry, because it will bleed and something can go wrong, right? I am crying with hiccups. I'm not able to control that, uh, that situation. And the doctor is trying to keep me awake. They're constantly talking to me. And I could hear. And he was saying, heartbeat, things are going wrong. And they all started to panic. And I could hear that, uh, uh, what is that called, that instrument? ECG or some, not ECG. She's a doctor, so I was asking her, Shweta. <laughs> so that, that it was doing something like I would hear beep, beep sound. And then uh, I got to know, enemy has already killed my child. Now he's trying to kill me. I said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. I just screamed. The moment I screamed, immediately my heartbeat started to function. And then the surgery went on well. And I come back home three days after that Sunday service. I told you it's a home church. I have only 10 people. I have no leaders. I've just started and I hardly know anything and I have no team to continue and I cannot ask my husband because he's equally down with me we are depressed we want to go and lock ourselves and cry that that situation so how will I go and uh, do the work no leaders to continue I came that Sunday and I just told I have just started speaking on faith series I have no answers to everything I don't know why it happened, what happened. But at that time, this is what I said. 
But one thing I know, God is good. God's word does not fail. I don't go by my experience. I don't go by my feelings. I go by what is written. And I choose to hold on to what is written. Sunday after Sunday, I had to preach that season of my life. And Monday to Saturday, my heart is broken. And again, I have to come and I have to embrace my calling. That was one of the toughest seasons most of the pastors go through. You know, you, they have their own pain, they have their own struggles, they have their own problem, yet they have to come and speak God's word, encourage others while they may be discouraged. But let me tell you, it is not that they are faking, they are passionate, they are convicted, they know that it is the true word of God. They know there is no way to go. At that time, I told my husband, I have no other option. I have no other way. If there is some other truth, I would go. But I know this is the truth. He is the living God. It is the living word. Where do I go from here? So I stick to this word. I stick to my uh, calling. I continue to do this. So then... At that time, my sister uh, who settled in Singapore, they called me from Rema Bible College saying, uh, why don't you come and study? Close down your church. Stop all this pastoring thing and all. You should take time to heal, take time to be mentally stable, study God's word and close down the church. And uh, the dean of Rema Bible College called me because they are uh, friends with my sister. So they called me saying, you come over here, close down. That was the most pivotal point of my life. Either I close down the church and go to Singapore to study and also to work because my sister and brother-in-law had already got me and my husband job there. So they told leave everything and come. There was so much of urge in my heart not to go. I wanted to stay back. I felt I don't have to run away from the call that God has. I, I, I am depressed. I am sad. But the solution is not running away. The solution is continuing. God has called me. He will continue to strengthen me. He will help me to do the call. I requested the dean. We call him uncle. I said, uncle, I don't want to come. Give me six more months. I will study God's word. I will continue what I'm doing. And after six months, if nothing is working out in the church, then I close down and I come to you. Then all my family members, everybody said, you're foolish. What a wrong decision. You're losing out on the job, on the money, on the seat in such a prestigious Bible college. You're missing out everything. I said, I'm not led. I, I am not led. And I, I, I was weeping. I said, please don't force me. The one person who stood by me was my husband. He said, I want, to, uh, I want to do what she wants to do. I want her to be happy. I don't want to do what is good uh, based on what others are counseling. I want to make my wife happy. So he encouraged me, so I stayed back. At that time, I started studying God's word like a madman. I was so emotionally down, and I did emotional eating. What is emotional eating? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. I found your words and I ate them. Amen. Your word was unto me joy and rejoicing of my heart. Amen. I kept reading 10 hours, morning to night. I got the books from, I don't name, top Bible colleges enrolled for every possible course. And I read for 10 hours, morning to night, and in the night I meditate on the scripture. I meditate on the scripture. And now if I am talking to you without tears in my eyes, it is nothing but the strength of God. God has given me emotional stability. The word has healed my heart. The word has made me a different person. Amen. So as I continued to study God's word, I meditated on God's word. I regained my strength and I started my ministry. I got into media work. I got into growth of the church, moved to another place, counseling, house visiting. I completely involved myself. I saw increase in every area of my life. And because it was cesarean, I had to wait for two years. So two years passed by. In these two years, I have studied God's word day and night, let me tell you. Hours and hours. 
As I continued in the word of God, I was so empowered, so equipped to do the work of the Lord. And now after two years, I planned for the baby. Because sometimes you don't know the value of things unless you lose it. When you lose it, you really want it back desperately. Now I want my second child. I want that baby because I held that baby and I, we had to bury that child. And it was a very devastating moment. So I want that back. Now after two years, I am uh, trying. It's not happening. It's not happening. We went to the doctor. Doctor said, it looks like all the reports are fine, but we don't know why it's not happening. You know why it's not happening? Because I was very depressed. And I had a lot of sorrow and baggage in my mind that had made my body weak. Very important. Very important. No wonder the Bible says, do not worry. No wonder the Bible says, do not be sad. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Because when you're worrying, when you're upset, it is not good for your body. Because it does not release good hormones. It releases chemicals. It releases bad hormones from your brain. And those bad hormones are bad for your body. It goes and damages the cell, damages a lot of things, a lot of organs. So what happened uh, after a few months again when we went, then doctors uh, told probably... They have to give some scientific name, right? They told anti mullerian hormone. It's okay. Don't have to buy hard that. AH, AMH is low. Progesterone could be low. Maybe vitamin D is low. Maybe insulin level is not proper. Maybe this, maybe that. So many negative reports they kept giving me. saying, And they asked me to go, to so, go and do so many uh, uh, tests. They told me to do blood tests, urine tests. They told my husband to do some tests. Then they told me we have to check if there is some problem with fallopian tubes, if there is blockage. So many tests. I'm doing test after test, and test, some tests came positive, and some of them, they had no answer. They said, probably this is wrong, that is wrong, so it's not happening. And when doctors kept giving me continuously negative report about my health and about the child, I continued, I continued. I said, doctor, you are giving me a report, but then I see there is another report. I read another report. I preach another report. The report says the word of the Lord is health to all flesh, life to those who find them. It says that he nurses when you're sick and he restores your health. It says I will bring health and healing and reveal abundance of peace and truth. It says surely he has carried my griefs and infirmities. He was smitten, stricken and afflicted of the Lord. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement that brought me peace was laid upon him and and by his stripes, I was healed. Not that I will be healed. I was healed. This is the report I read. This is the report I preach. So I'm not able to accept the report that you're giving me. I'm not able to accept that you're telling there is sickness in my body. How can there be sickness in my body? I am a life-giving spirit. Christ, the hope of glory, is living inside of me. I am becoming stronger, younger, healthier, and more beautiful. As my days are, so shall be my strength. I kept preaching this to myself every day. When they say that you're becoming old, people say you're becoming weak. No, 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 no. Who said you're becoming old? Who said you're becoming weak? As my days are, so shall be my strength. As I grow, I become stronger. I become more beautiful, isn't it? That's the word of the Lord. It's a written word of God. Let all men be a liar. Let God alone be true. Amen. That's the word we believe. Standing on the word of God. Uncompromised word of God. You have to make up your mind. And I kept confessing. I kept believing. I said, Jesus, you were anointed by Father. You went about doing good. Healing all who were sick. And delivered them who were oppressed of devil. The Bible says, right? He healed all your sickness and forgive all your iniquities. All means all. Amen. There is no name 
of the sickness that does not come under that all that blood of Jesus has washed. Amen. Whatever report you are giving me, I don't buy it. I shake my head to the doctor, but I don't shake my faith. Amen. I continue to stand. I continue to believe. When I feel like crying, when past memories come, memories come, right? When memories haunt you, holding the dead child in your hand, and you know, I, I had put on weight, right? Pregnancy weight. And people would ask, why are you fat? What happened? That's a very sad thing, right? For women, <laughs> you tell a woman, you have become thin. That's the best compliment. You don't have to tell them you look beautiful. You don't have to tell them your dress is good. Just tell them you have become thin. It makes us very happy. <laughs> and they are coming and asking me, why are you fat? And I cannot say, I just lost the child. And you know, uh, I, you know, I had to take tablets for the milk to stop breastfeeding. What a turmoil it was. And I had to conduct, it was season of wedding in my house. I was uh, conducting, uh, I'm the pastor of my brother. So I am doing the marriage for my brother. And all the relatives and family and friends, everybody has come. I am standing there and all are saying, what happened? Why Pastor Bria has put on weight? And I have no answer. It was a very sad scene. I'm just laughing and telling you now uh, because God is good. Amen. So I continued. And after uh, that, as I studied God's word, and what happens? M Mark chapter 4, it says, please read Mark chapter 4, verse 26 onwards. It talks about the parable of a sower. What he sows? He sows the word. When you sow the word, the seed is what? The word of God. When he sows the word, the word will grow. It has a pattern. There is a system. You cannot beat the system of God's word. The pattern is first the ear, then the blade, then full corn, right? Mark chapter 4, verse 28, 29, 30, 31. You read that portion. You can write it down. Very, very powerful scripture. So as I continue to meditate, first the year. So that means here and there I could see some signs. So I was super excited. Then no matter what they told, I said, okay, fine. We are planning for the baby. And then we plan for the baby. And then I go to the doctor. They confirmed, yes, you have conceived. Uh, it's fine. They did my first scan. They said the scan shows everything is good. And then that Christmas, I'm dancing in the church because, uh, you know, I've conceived. I don't say any word, but I am dancing. I'm super excited. And then uh, I have to go to third month scan, right? So when I go to third month scan, they say, I'm very sorry to say there is no heartbeat. I was like, oh, my God. I thought the word worked. I thought the word became flesh. I thought my confession worked. I thought everything is going on well. I thought I understood. Now the revelation. Now what has gone wrong? Again, back to square one with another thousand questions. What happened? How to make this work? Then I come out weeping, crying from the scan room. I keep crying at home and then I, I, I strengthened myself and then I came with the series training on thinking. Amen. So I started to train myself on thinking and I kept confessing Philippians 3.13, this one thing I do. What is the one thing I do? One thing I do, forgetting what is in the past and pressing forward towards the high calling that God has for me. So I choose to forget. I don't choose to remember. I have choice. You can stop repeating, rehearsing, replaying the bad memories in your mind. It is very much possible. When Jesus said, John 14, 1, he said, do not let your heart be troubled. That means it is in our control. We can control our heart and emotions and mind not to let it be troubled. So when wrong things, when thoughts would come of past failures, disappointments, it, when, it, when it used to come, it discourages. So I, this verse I held on to. I would speak out loud because we don't fight thoughts with 
thoughts. We fight thoughts with words. So I, I spoke loudly. I said this one thing I do. I choose to forget. I don't repeat. I don't rehearse. I don't want to replay. I tell my mind, casting down all imagination, bringing it to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, if you're writing. So I started to bring down the thoughts to the obedience of Christ. How? By speaking, by sending the word, by confessing. So when I speak, I believe more. Amen? It made me to forget. So that is how I was able to forget. That is how I was able to overcome. And then what I did, I took 110 scriptures on healing. And I started to confess every day. For three months I did. After three months I left. I'll tell you why. For three months, every day, I would confess, I am healed by his stripes. Yes, Jesus went about doing good. All things are possible for him who believes. I took all the healing scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, from Gospels. I kept speaking, the son of righteousness has risen with healing in his wings. Amen. I am healed. I kept speaking after three months. I'm seeing nothing much is happening. What is going wrong? I think I'm doing everything right. I am speaking the word. God told me to forget the former things of old. I have tried my best to forget the former things of old. But still something is going wrong. I want to tell you. In, in my testimony, I'm also uh, explaining the process of how the word works. I came to realize that I had made faith works. I thought by confessing 110 scriptures, I will be healed. I thought by confessing 110 scriptures, things are going to change. It's not what you do that will bring result. It is what Christ has done that will bring result. You must understand this. Amen. I'm glad you are able to relate with me. Amen. So I came to realize that, okay, it's not that my confession is going to bring healing. Eventually, I learned, okay, my confession is not bringing healing. I must get that I was healed. 2 Peter 2.24 does not say I will be healed. It says, you were healed. It's in past tense. I was healed. Now to get to that understanding was not easy. <laughs> Those of you who are uh, having some sickness in the body, it will really help you. To get to that understanding for me, it was not easy. I'm preaching Sunday after Sunday. But to get to the understanding that I'm already healed. When there is sickness in the body persisting. Pain in the body persisting. All the reports are uh, saying something else from the word. I had to stick to that. So I continued in the word. Now again in the year. Uh, yeah. Uh, end of 2020. That's uh, beginning of 21. Yeah. I conceived. Again, I was super excited. Then doctors told me, why did you conceive? We told you AMH is low, progesterone is low. All the senior gynecologists sat around me. Before that, I had also consulted one, uh, one more senior doctor. They told, even if you try IVF also, 40% chances it is not going to happen. And then all the senior gynecologists, they sat, they said, we told you it is not going to work. Why did you conceive? And they panicked more than me. They told me to do the insulin test. And they told me, every day morning, you have to send the report morning after afternoon, night, they put me through so much trauma. They were doing their job. I, I don't blame them. But it was becoming too hectic and tiring for me. And then I saw that, like, this is something wrong. And there was so much fear because they told me, send the reports in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night. Send the report. See if the insulin is proper. We have to check if insulin is because we, we are not able to find. You know, till today in my discharge summary, it says unexplained IUD. That means it's unexplained. They have no reason. There is no genetic problem, no BP, no sugar, no thyroid. There is no reason. So they are confused. Science is very limited. <laughs> Only God's word has solution. Amen. Only God's word has healing. Jesus is the balm of Gilead. Amen. He is indeed. So they did all and they advised me not to go for it. But then now already uh, I have gone against their decision. I thought in my mind, you told me firstly that I cannot conceive. Now that I have already conceived, that means what you told is lie. That means this also is going to be a lie. 
So they, they told, okay, fine, let's see. They gave me so many tablets, so many tests. I continued. After third, fourth month, as usual, I go to the scan. And the scan, first two months, everything was fine, okay? First two scans were fine. After that, they say, it is, uh, sorry, there is no heartbeat. Again, I come out. I'm not able to control my tears. Every time I go into the scan room, it's like graveyard. I go with the with, go inside, I come out with sorrow. And again, I'm not able to control my tears. My husband came, he held my hand. He said, your reaction to this will determine your destiny. Don't cry. Hold back your tears. We have already won. We stand on victory ground. We are not starting the race from the initial point. We are already in the finish line. He said, don't cry. I immediately took his words and it encouraged me, word in the season. I stopped crying. Then I went to the doctor and my gynecologist started crying because I am not crying. <laughs> I, I'm serious. My gynecologist is crying because uh, the, the, they are believers. I mean, do, two of them, they are believers. They follow my messages. So they were so upset for me. They are worrying for me. Then I was like, uh, okay, what do I do? I'm not crying. So they, they're thinking, why I'm not crying? <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I didn't say anything. We had to wear masks. I was wearing masks, so he could not see my emotions much. I was just keeping quiet. Then I go back home. And then that day was Saturday, and they gave me a tablet for women in the house, so I can say. They gave me a tablet uh, for the miscarriage, for the clearing process. And the doctor knew that I preach on Sunday. So he said, mostly everything will happen on Monday. So you start the course from now. So it was Saturday. So Saturday I take the course and I have to preach uh, on Sunday. So I thought, okay, Sunday I'll preach and Monday uh, things will happen. Saturday in the middle of the night, the clearing process starts. I have heavy bleeding. In the morning, 6.30, I am unable to stand. I am totally weak. I'm like, what's happening to me? And 7.30 is my first service to preach. Then my husband said, let's call the leader. In these two years, I have grown. My leadership in my, my team has grown. By now, I've got leaders. So he said, call the leaders. Let someone preach today. I said, let me see for some time. And then at 6.30, I'm like feeling like puking and something is happening. I kept confessing, saying, let the weak say, I am strong. The Lord is in midst of me and I have the strength of a wild ox. That's what the word of God says. So I continued to speak. The minute you speak, what happens? There is energy. There is supernatural strength that comes from within. I stood up. I said, I'm going to church. I'm preaching. My husband said, can you do it? I said, what am I going to do? Sit at home and cry? Keep crying? Looking at what's going wrong in my life? At least I preach to myself. I go and preach. And that day my sermon was, Jesus, the righteous right hand of God. Amen. <laughs> the right hand of God is comforting me, counseling me, encouraging me, and holding me. Amen. So I preached my heart's content, and I was very happy. Amen. I was very happy. And I remember that day, I went and sat on the chair, and my whole chair was filled with blood. I was thinking, thank God nobody saw. I just wiped it. I went home, and I did not cry. I said, I'm not crying. And I told, devil, you will not find tears here. I have made up my mind whether my experience matches with the word, or my emotions matches with the word, or not. I continue to choose to believe the word, speak the word, meditate, and preach this word. I made up my mind that day. And next Sunday, I, I, I preached a sermon called, Quitting is not in my blood. Amen. <laughs> and I said, do not let delay bother you. These were all titles of my message. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. I told, quitting is not in my blood because Jesus set his face as flint, it says in Isaiah, and he went straight to the cross. So I said, I go straight to finish the purpose that God has for my life. So these things are not going to stop me. I'm not going to quit because I have the DNA of Jesus. What I do, I take Holy Communion every day. 
So I eat the body and the blood of Jesus and God gave me a powerful revelation during that season in my life. In the book of Leviticus it says, life of the creature is in the blood and you are not supposed to eat the blood. It's forbidden in the book of Leviticus to eat the blood. Now Jesus is coming, standing in the midst of Jewish people, Jewish disciples and he says, eat my body drink my blood and they are like what are you saying we are forbidden from drinking the blood of any animal and you're saying to drink your blood what was Jesus saying God gave me this powerful revelation that changed my life I got to know life of the creature is in the blood and Jesus is telling me to drink his blood until Jesus come it was forbidden after Jesus came it is mandatory that we should take the blood of Jesus now your life and my life is in the blood of Jesus. Amen. I started taking the blood day after day. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Every day I started drinking the blood. I found this new medicine. I found this revelation. And I found that Jesus already finished. He has worked my healing. And my restoration is already done. Now when I confess, now I went back to the confession again. Let me tell you. I'm not nullifying confession. I went back to my confession. Now I saw it's not that I will be healed. It's not that I will be restored. I saw that I was healed. I was restored. It started to take root from within. Amen. When it started to take root from within, first the ear, then the blade, then full con. I was already super excited because they told me I'm not able to conceive and already conceived. They told me I am weak. I have this problem, that problem. I'm already strong. I, I can see the word working. And let me tell you, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we don't work, you can write it down, we don't work only on our spirit or on our soul. Many a times, we work only on our soul or we work only on our body. Sometimes people work on the body, fitness, fitness, exercise, exercise, eating, good eating, good food. Or people work on soul, read the word, study the word, hear the word, keep listening, keep listening. Either they are working only on the soul or they are working only on the body. God started to teach me, you are working only on the soul. You are not working on your body. Look at your body. You have become weak. I don't see you drinking more water. I don't see you doing too much exercise. Too much mean, what do I mean? I walk, pandemic, right? Everything was <laughs> locked down. I walk at home. I said, I did exercise and I sit down. Then God told, that's not what you need to do. You need to be more active. Do more aggressive workout endorphins are released we cannot nullify our physical body our body is the temple of God many believers many Christians you know where we fail we go to church we give our tithe we listen to messages we confess we we have faith but we nullify our body by not eating well by not concentrating on nutrition or exercise when we nullify you know that is area of ignorance and ignorance is foothold to Satan. It's foothold to devil. Any area that's not doing well in your life, whether it's body or soul or finances, any area, you can be sure you're ignorant in that area. You're struggling with some addiction, teenagers, youngsters, you feel like I am a sinner, I'm struggling with something. There's the area of ignorance. What is ignorance? You are the righteousness of God. So you must know, you must know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. So I, then I started to work on all the three. Spirit, complete. There's nothing to do about it. Spirit is identical to Jesus. Soul, that is we study the word of God. And body, body is that I take care because I am the temple of living God. I take care of my body. I eat well. I, I do exercise. I take time to take communion and I meditate to see I am the body. The Bible says, right? Church is what? Church is the body of Christ. So the meal that heals, Holy Communion. So I started to take the meal that heals. I started to meditate on Holy Communion. And, I, and God gave me amazing, amazing, amazing revelations. And I came up with this quote. Every time I take the Holy Communion cup, what I say? I say, Jesus died. Jesus died. Every right of Satan on me is forever denied. Amen. I started getting these revelations, these quotes, and got to see the power of his word. Because Jesus is the word. The body and the blood is the word. Then 
my husband said let's not chase this dream forget about this baby and all god has a call on your life now don't go for again for baby you're putting your life in risk your church in risk your purpose the call that god has upon your life in risk at that time my first my older daughter she comes mom you're putting me at risk <laughs> she said well, she didn't understand she thought okay something they are talking about risk so she thought somewhere i'm leaving her and going or something so i was like it was very emotional time for me and he was like no no we are not going for it let's not go for it but in my heart i already told you quitting is not in my blood in my heart i'm like no i have to see this word work right i have to see the practical things how this word works i have to take risk because faith takes risks amen and in the process i learned one very powerful truth faith works by love amen faith works by love you might do confession you 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 you, you might uh, you might uh, do the uh, laws of faith do not doubt believe all those things but the bottom line the basic thing is that faith works by love what does that mean galatians 5 6 if you are writing that scripture faith works by love that means knowing how much your father loves you at the beginning of my sermon i said knowing he him as daddy god knowing him as father knowing how much your father loves you when you know that it helps you because at that time i got a thought i thought like three times i have failed still born and two times three times bad news now i was asking this to myself now if i go for the baby again how am i going to lead the journey of 9 months will there be any fear i am asking this to myself and i i told this to holy spirit you can be frank with god there's nothing to fake with god he knows you in and out and he loves you anyway i told god i might struggle with fear what am i going to do if i am going to have fear every day fear is the heart beat there not there because i experienced that second time third time so is everything going good not going good what's going wrong what's happening inside how do i know so because i already experienced fear now how i can be no longer slave to fear was my question because when a person experience failure after fa- failure wrong reports after wrong reports disappointment after disappointment bad breaks bad marriage somewhere it makes you to fear in life the fear comes like a canopy and it tries to encamp and we become very fearful to speak to people fearful to take decisions fearful to look into people's eyes or to embrace our purpose to embrace our call fearful to take any major decision so i asked god how how i can overcome this and holy spirit gave me that scripture first john 4:18 perfect love casteth out fear god is love that's what it says and perfect love casteth out fear i said perfect love casteth out fear so what 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 do you mean god was teaching me you must know the love of god know the unconditional love of god know the finished work of christ when you know the finished work of cross when you know the word of god is unchangeable heaven and earth will pass but his word shall not pass his word is fire his word is hammer his word is seed his word becomes flesh amen so when you know this you will experience the end result of your faith it says in second peter 1 the end result of your faith when can you get the end result of your faith when you know the love of god then i continue to meditate on the love of god then i started teaching the series on growing in love perfect love you're precious to god the love of god became such a big topic in my mind i started looking at things that god loves me you must know this all of you dear friend you must know this you all believe that god loves everybody it's not enough to know god loves everybody you must say god loves me me god loves me if 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 there is a point sometime in your life when you are alone if you say god loves me more than everybody it's okay to say that that's what i told to myself god loves me i am his beloved amen i am the beloved whom jesus loves i started to tell this i started to meditate on this i became so personal to with the statement to me that god loves me more than anyone 
God loves everybody, but it is like John. John will tell, right? I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Jesus loves everybody. But I started to say, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. And I started to say this. I started to know that God loves me. And I experienced that love empowering me. That love is so powerful, it breaks any bondage, any sickness in your body. Let me tell you the love of God. The love of God. How can you know the love of God? Can, can you answer me? How can you know the love of God? I told you, you must know the love of God. How to know the love of God? Look at the cross. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, you, you, you can be right. You can be wrong. Blessings, yes. Know that he is your dad. Amen. How, how can you know the love of God? How to know? Thank you for that amazing answer. <laughs> Amen. That's the answer that I was looking for. All of you answers what you gave is very good. The, the uh, uh, right, accurate answer is the word of God. You know why? Who tells you that God loves you? The word. The word tells you that God loves you. You don't have to believe anybody. The word has to tell you. Amen. When you see in the word, when you see the word, the word tells you it is finished work. The word tells you he is your father. The word tells you that he has restored you and died for you. The word reveals everything. In the beginning was not science. In the beginning was not Albert Einstein. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when you know the word, the word tells you how much God loves you. So you have to be like ostrich sticking the head in the mud, right? Like that you have to be in the word, meditate the word. I'm not saying leave your job, resign and do that. What I mean to say is constantly meditate on the word. When you know the word, the word reveals the love of God. When you know the New Testament, oh, epistles, amazing, amazing work of God. When you know the New Testament, when you know the epistles, when you read the epistles, that's very important as a new believer or even old believer, I would say. Uh, read the epistles. Once you finish the epistles, then you can go to Old Testament. Because I remember as a Christian, uh, the beginning of the year, I would start off reading Old Testament. I would read always from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then stopped. <laughs> and then I thought like, okay, okay, now again next year, Genesis, Exodus, I'm always there in Old Testament. Then I got to know as years passed by, I came to the epistles. I completed the Old Testament, then came to New Testament. Then I came to the epistles. When I read the epistles, oh, what amazing revelation. What amazing truth of who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. That's what you know there. So when you read the word, you know who you are in Christ. When you read the word, you know what you have in Christ. That is where you know the love of God. That is where you see God made him sin who knew no sin so that you can be made the righteousness, the right standing with God. Amen. God made him poor so that you can be made rich. Where is it? It is in the epistle. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Two scriptures. So God shows you from the word that he loves you. And when you meditate on the word, don't miss meditating, reading the word. For everything that you need, answer is the word. When God wants to bless you, you know what he gives you first? The word. When devil wants to trouble you, what he does? He steals the word. He first takes the word. So when you, when you receive the word, you know, when you, you, the Bible says, right? Deuteronomy 18.8, it does not say God gives you money. It says God gives you power. To make wealth. What is that power? The word of God. When you have the word, you have the power to make wealth, to make anything. Amen. So when you know the word, you actually know the love of God. So I grew in the love of God. Oh, I was free from fear. I was no longer slave to fear. And then I told my husband, we are planning again this time. <laughs> And then uh, in uh, 21, 2021, uh, August, that's last year, August, I conceived. This is my fifth baby. It's there in my discharge summary. <laughs> fifth baby. So I told five is number of grace. I am born on five, five. God's grace is upon me. He has poured out his grace on me. I'm encouraging myself, yeah? So I'm telling all these things. And I said, okay, we are going for this now. 
everybody is afraid. And let me tell you, nobody knows this in my family. Uh, my parents, my siblings. I didn't want to tell. Why? I didn't want to tell my friends, my church. Why? Only my husband knew. Why? Because I didn't want an unbelief. I didn't want people worrying. I don't want people to look at me with the lens of sickness. With lens of some problem, some infertility issues. I don't want people to say, she is weak. I don't know if it's going to happen again. Worry. People worry. And people think worrying is loving. You know, we, we are, I worry for you. That means they think they love you. I said, please don't worry for me. Because if you worry, worrying is welcoming Satan. I, I, I wrote this quote I, and I, I preached on worrying in the church. When you are worrying, you are giving him red carpet welcome. Come. He is seeking whom he may devour. First, devour. First Peter 5, 7. He is seeking whom he may devour, right? Whom he wants to devour? Those who are worrying. Because worrying is fear. Worrying is negative thinking. Worrying is replaying, rehearsing <laughs> in your mind. Negative things. Replaying, rehearsing. What could go wrong is worrying. Right? So, I told no worrying. And I don't want to tell anybody who will worry for me. I didn't want to go to that doctor because the doctor is my friend and he worries for me and he cried for me. So, I told I'm not going to that doctor because he's worrying for me. I want to find a person who, who has no relationship with me who will no way worry for me. So, I found another doctor. I went and I didn't give any reports. But you know how medical science is. They say, give me your history. Give me your history. What went wrong? And they take all the history. Every time I go to a scan report, I have to repeat the history. I don't want to repeat because I have forgotten. I don't remember. One point of time, I, I was like, uh, I was not happy with the questions of the nurse. I said, I don't remember that. She said, what? I said, I have forgotten. I, I have no memory of that. <laughs> she didn't understand because God told me to forget, right? Now, how I can remember? I said, I don't remember. And then she said, oh, okay. And then she saw the report and then she wrote it down, the nurse. And then they're just uh, writing down. And then I went to this doctor who does not worry for me. I said, I don't want anybody to worry. And I didn't tell this even to my congregation because congregation loves me, right? Then they will worry for me. And they worry for me and put me in trouble. And they will come and speak something. I am very afraid for you. I don't know what is going to happen. Pastor, you should live long. <laughs> So I thought, let them not worry for me. And I did not tell this to anybody. First scan, normal. Third scan uh, was uh, normal. And then they made me again do all the tests. And then doctor told, whenever I go to scan, my last scan, uh, they made me do so many scans. For normal people, they don't do so many scans. They only three scans. For me, they did so many scans because they're very afraid. And then the doctor is telling me, this must be a scary scan for you. It was ninth month scan. Because last time, ninth month stillborn, right? I looked at him. I said, no, I am not at all scared. He thought, like, oh, why? I, I, there's no point explaining. I said, I'm not scared. It is not a scary scan. I know my future. I, it's, it's written in a book, and I have read. The path of righteous gets brighter and brighter. My future is glorious. So I am not worrying. I am not afraid. And the ninth month scan was fine. And then doctor told me, let's not wait for 38 weeks. Because last time, 36, 37 weeks, it went wrong. We have to take the baby out fast and we'll keep it in NICU. We'll keep it in NICU so that we at least see what's happening in NICU. In the womb, we don't get to see. And all the doctors tried to convince me, telling that, let us not wait. Let's go. Now, ninth month, 37 weeks. Just imagine the scene. I've already gone through such a big journey and turmoil. Now all doctors are suggesting me, don't go against our advice. Till now, everything has gone well. 36 weeks is decent enough. We'll take out the baby, keep it in NICU. I'm like, no NICU. This baby, if I have come till nine months, it is the word become flesh. And every day when I am taking communion, you know what I confess? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. It pleased Yahweh to crush him. Why? So that his seed will live and the days of his seed shall be prolonged. My seed will live because I am the seed of Abraham. I am in Christ. I am the seed of God. This seed will live. That is what I believe. So I am not going for NICU business. I continue. 
So that two weeks, 14 days, the doctor used to call me every day. Is everything fine? Are you checking the moments? Please check the moments and send us. Morning, afternoon, night. So I, I, I calculate uh, the moments and send. If, if I don't send them the moments, if I'm busy, they call, what happened? I have not got the moments. I'm like, no, I was busy. So it went on. And then the last, uh, before the, uh, after 14th day, uh, it, it was planned C-section. So I go to the hospital. When I go to the hospital, then uh, that day they did my, what is that called? NST, NST test. When they're doing NST test, I, I, had, uh, I, I was dehydrated. Uh, I, had, uh, I was very dehydrated and there was no much water. They told, you are dehydrated. In NST, we are unable to find the baby, unable to find the heartbeat. This is uh, the day after, the last day I've gone to the hospital. They said, again, we are not able to see, and three hours they did NST test. I am like, it's okay, you leave me, I want to sleep. They don't know. Our senior doctor has told us personally that we have to do this test for you because they, they have taken now extra care, they are my friends. Uh, in the course, they became my friends. <laughs> I didn't go to my friends. And then they saw all that. And then three hours they did. After three hours, they said, okay. I told God, I know everything is fine. Let them know everything is fine, so they leave me to sleep. So then they got to know everything is fine. They left me to sleep. And that day night, it was 1.30 when they left me to sleep. I told, I am not worrying. Nothing goes wrong. I have learned to sleep in the storm. Amen. When the storms of life hit you, you know, the best thing to do is to sleep. Not to rise up and say, I rebuke the wind and the waves. Why should it bother us? We are like Jesus. Amen. He is living inside of us. Let me rest. In the due course, I learned resting is the final state of faith. Amen. I rested in the finished work, rested in the promises of God, rested knowing that he's holding my hand and everything will go on well. I rested. I wanted to see the word become flesh. I rested knowing, rest assured, the word will not fail. He's upholding all things by the power of his word. He's upholding your career by the power of his word. He's upholding your future by the power of his word. He's upholding your husband, your spouse by the power of his word. Everything that you see around is the result of his word. So when you speak the word, it works. So I rested. I know I rest because everything is finished. Amen. I rested and then I had a healthy, beautiful, champion baby girl. I want to show you that picture. I bought the picture to show all of you. It was just two months back. I am a new mother. I have a two months old baby. Are you able to see because of the light? It's not very bright, because, I think because of the light. Okay, you can show the next pictures. Restoration baby. She's uh, very strong, very tall, very beautiful, very healthy baby. That's me. <laughs> My husband calls me champion pastor. <laughs> they told me that I cannot do it. Everybody told me I cannot do it. But God's word told something else. And God helped me to do it. Amen. <laughs> So in the entire testimony, it is not that I have got my baby. It is not what I have received. It's not the result. My husband, while preaching that particular Sunday, he told, it is not the end result. It is not what we have received. It is what you have become in the process. What I have become. I've become a superwoman. Wonder Woman, what I have become. He told me, I have seen my wife as, he met me when I was 21, as a young girl who was emotionally too unstable, very sensitive. Now, I see my wife as a woman who has harnessed her emotions, who knows to take control of her emotions, has mastered 
over her emotions. That is what I have become in the due course. And in the journey, I have learned the power of his word. In the journey, I have learned anything that I need in my life. I have to just stand on the word and not listen to naysayers. Don't listen to the doctors or yourself, your emotions, your loved ones. Just go by what is written. Amen. Fix your eyes, fix your ears, fix your heart, fix your mind on the written word of God. Let that word enter your eyes, your ears and come out of your mouth. Amen. And when you do that, the word becomes flesh. It is the system of God and nobody can break that. Nobody can change that. Amen. It is the system of God. So it is what you become. That is what God, God has a plan. I told God has purpose. So what I have become, it has made me stronger. I am strong. Now I am not worried of what went wrong. This baby came to erase my memories, bad memories, erase all the things. Why? Because I had already chosen to erase them. Amen. Now coming to the second point. First, point. first point I spoke on embracing your call, being faithful. Second thing, do I have time? Okay, being faithful. Second thing is being fruitful. Being fruitful. How can you be fruitful? You can be fruitful. This is my personal revelation from the Lord. For all those who want to be fruitful, who wants to bear much fruit. Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Now his words have to remain in you. So what are his words? If you are having some past memories, uh, some bad things that you have gone through, I learned this, forgetfulness brings fruitfulness. Amen? Forgetfulness brings fruitfulness. We have to learn to forget, forget the former things. When you forget the past, it helps you to produce. I saw that uh, if in the book of um, Exodus when jo Joseph, when Joseph gave the names of the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh means forgetfulness. Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. When did that happen? So God gave me this revelation when you forget the past, when you forget uh, the things that went wrong, when you forget the bad memories, that's when you will be, uh, you'll be able to produce. You will be very fruitful. You can be fruitful. Bear much fruit. Whatever. Say, I'm called to pastor. You, you might be called to be a businesswoman, to be a singer, worshiper, called to be a homemaker, take care of children, doctors, engineers, whatever. You're working in a corporate organization. Whatever God has called you to, let the bad memories, let the wrong things that enemy has done against you, let that not hold you back. Let it not stop you from moving forward, taking risks and doing exploits because they that know their God are strong and shall do exploits. So if you know your God, now how to know your God? John 8, 31 says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. My people perish for what? For lack of knowledge. So when we have the knowledge of God, when we know for anything, young people, unmarried people, married people, single, for anything that you need, whatever is the stage of your life, for everything, you know the word as you continue. Now you may have few answers. Now whatever I have given my testimony, I have tried to teach through my testimony to be faithful, to be fruitful. Uh, as I've done this, you will be able to relate to your personal experience. And now you might have got majority of answers or there could be that you are still yet to get some specific answers. But as you continue in the word, you will know the truth. And when you forget, forget, choose to forget forget the past, choose to forget the sorrows. When you choose that bad things, bad memories, it helps you to be fruitful and you will bear much fruit and that brings glory to the Father. Amen. When our prayers are answered, when you read the book of John chapter 14, you can read at home the whole chapter. I just put one or two verses from there. John chapter 14, when you read the chapter, you understand that when your prayers are answered, God gets glory and he's very happy when you have your answered prayers, when he sees you produce much, when he sees you be fruitful, when he sees you are not just a 30-fold, it might be that 
we all start off with 30 fold, right? 30 fold, I'm talking about Mark chapter four, when the sower sows the word, the returns can be 30 fold. We all start off with 30 fold, but it can move on to 60 fold. But for sure, with the strength of the Holy Spirit, with the word that you've planted in your heart, you will bear 100 fold return. You will bear much fruit. No, you are complete in him. I told you, whether you are single, whether you are unmarried, you are young, you are old, you are strong, and you are complete in him. Amen? That's what it says in Colossians chapter 3, when you read 8, 9, 10, it says that you are in Christ, and he is in you. Colossians 3, 11 says, and 8, 9, 10, when you read the whole, the talks about Christ in you. It says, you are complete in him. Anybody who's a single parent here, don't ever think so many things went wrong in my life, in my past. How am I going to bring up my children? What is there in my future? I want to tell you, you're complete in him. He is a partner in your parenting. Amen? You're complete in Christ. And God will bring forth the fruit that he has through your life. Amen? How many mothers are here? Okay, okay, majority, okay. So uh, I thought it, this uh, testimony of mine will encourage you and help you. Right now, I would like to take time to pray. So you all, whatever uh, you are waiting for, for the manifestation, we are not going to pray for God to do something. You all know God has already done. If you're still on the, in the mindset, how to get to the revelation of God has already done. I told you, continue to hear the word on God has already done. See the epistles. When you read the book of epistles, uh, after the book of Acts. After Acts, when you read, you understand the finished work and it has to take root. See, it is one thing to have head knowledge. It is one thing to memorize scriptures. It is totally another thing to know from deep down in the heart. So when you confess from your heart, when you speak from your heart, when you believe in your heart, that's what Jesus said, right? Mark 11, 23, 24 favorite verse, what he said. Well, when you pray, believe that you have received. What you have to believe and where you have to believe, believe it in your heart. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, do not doubt, believe it in your heart, not in our head. When you believe it in our heart, that's when we are able to see the manifestation. So let's believe. So if there is anybody here, I would like to uh, I, I don't want you to come forward or call names because there's another session for the lack of time. You can be wherever you are we will pray now, and as I have spoken faith, faith comes by hearing the word of God. I've spoken faith to you. I've spoken the power of his word. Now you speak the word, and you receive what God has already done. See, when it says, when you believe, you receive. What's the meaning of receive? The word receive, in English it is receive. When you see that in Greek, New Testament is written in Greek. When you see that in Greek, it says to take. It says to take. Say so here there's clock. I just take it. I just take it. That's it. So when you pray, you, you're just taking it. It's already there. At the cross of Calvary, he has given spouse. He has given children. He has given money. He has given whatever you need, whatever you're waiting for. Healing. Everything is finished. So what you do, faith has come now. Faith is already there. You have faith of the sun in your heart. What do I mean faith has come? That means it has come into your mind. You've got the understanding. Now that faith has arose in you, now when we pray, Whichever part of your body you're seeing sickness, negative reports, you can lay your hands because Christ is in you. You don't want me to come and lay my hands on you. You can lay your hands and I speak the word. He sent his word and healed our disease. 107 verse 20, Psalm. So I'm going to send the word. So you, what you do? You send the word and at the cross of Calvary, everything is there. So you believe in your heart. And those who believe in the heart, what happens? They receive. What's the meaning of receive? To take. So I just take it and walk out of the conference. So today, when you uh, finish your prayer, you will walk out of the conference by taking what you need. The moment you have taken it, my dear friend, you've taken it in the spirit. You've taken it in your heart. Don't say, Pastor, I opened my bag and saw money is not there. You told me to take should I take somebody else? No, you don't have to, right? So what you do, you take it and then you put it in your heart and what happens? It continues to 
grow. It continues to grow. And that word will become flesh. You will see that very soon. So shall we pray? Thank you, Daddy God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this wonderful time. Thank you, Jesus, that you have spoken to your people. Holy Spirit, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Daddy God, at this point of time, I send the word. The Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. If there is anyone who is sick in the body, right now I plead the precious blood of Jesus. We take the healing that you have already provided for them and anyone who's waiting for their restoration their lost years the years the locust has eaten we take the years that locust has eaten daddy god thank you we take and reverse the time the bible says he will give sevenfold restoration we receive sevenfold restoration for everyone over here daddy god thank you jesus we take it by faith we take the healing we take the finances we take their restoration we take everything that is on their mind that your children are waiting for thank you that you already provided you already have done this we receive it for thy glory to you be all praise and glory in jesus holy and matchless name we pray amen